This talk uh, is about advancing our capabilities to map and monitor coral reefs globally uh, with global information to local detail. This is not only work from me, this work from heaps of people and some of them you will know uh, because they have been long time around on, on the UQ campus or you know them from other projects. Uh, Stuart and I have been working, Stuart Finn and I are working together since 1990 and we both work at the Remote Sensing Research Center where Stuart is uh, the director here at UQ. Um, and this is work which is a result of 20 years of looking at coastal zones, at coral reefs, um, at seagrass habitat, mangroves, but also at water quality uh, in these environments. Um, so what has been done on coral reefs till now um, and why do we map reefs? There's all kinds of reasons why we map reefs. And I think several of you are, have been working on coral reefs as well and are very well aware why, why you want to use them. So they can provide ecosystem services. They help with envi understanding environmental impacts, coral reef conservation or reef functioning. Um, example are, for instance, the work by Spalding looking at tourism re revenue on the reef, which he could only do by having a, some kind of habitat map of the reef, uh, or the work in regards to bleaching damage. Again, to do that, you need some kind of habitat map. Uh, conservation work by Bayer et al, looking at marine spatial planning, uh, in this case, Zanzibar, and then the functioning of reefs, looking at carbonate production uh, work with um, uh, Sarah Hamilton. All these projects have in common that one of the baseline data sets used, uh, although it doesn't seem so important, is a habitat map. And so it's clear that the habitat maps can be used for all kinds of purposes. Now, just to set that straight to know, we habitat maps uh, are used by scientists and managers. Uh, they represent, in our case, the benthic environment, the algae, rubble, sand, seagrass, and corals. Uh, or the different geomorphic zones. And you can see on this image, the satellite image on the background, those different zones and the different compositions of each of these zones. So um, these geomorphic zones tell us something about uh, um, how they are formed and where they are and how they're protecting. But usually we also know that if you want to dive and you see some fish, you go to the slope and you usually don't end up in the lagoon. Although I can say there's some very nice environments there as well. If you look at habitat maps, you can look at different scales. And some of people who have seen my talks before will recognize this because I always try to take care that everybody is at the same kind of level before going into detail. So we have these different uh, scales, a reef system, reef type, geomorphic zone, and benthic. And reef system, you can, for instance, look at um, the Capricorn Bunker Group, it's a group of reefs uh, and each of these reefs are equally important. Each reef could be a specific reef. You could have fringing reefs, lagoonal reef or barrier reefs. Uh, you could have the different geomorphic zones within these reefs and you could have also different benthic habitats uh, that make up these reefs. And that can all be mapped using uh, remote sensing uh, or airborne satellite or airborne imagery and using the understanding of texture, color, physical attributes, but also neighborhood relationships between mapping categories. But also the understanding of this environment. So for instance, where, where massive plate and branching or mixed corals grow and how they, for instance, relate to wave action uh, helps us to predict where we find certain coral types. And I'll show you an example of that later on. Um, but before we can map a reef environment using remote sensing, we also need to understand the challenges that remote sensing face. It, you have to imagine just having a camera that is looking at the Earth's surface and that uh, collects the reflected sunlight of the Earth's surface, what's reflected on the Earth's surface. But through it pass through the atmosphere, uh, it, the, the signal gets changed through it pass through the water column, it gets changed as well. And obviously in clear waters, you can see deeper than in turbid water. And that's of course a challenge when you map in the coastal zone, because we all know there's a lot of variation there. 
Now, if it would all stand still, that would be easy. But as we know, it's not standing still. You have tidal differences, so every image could be taken at a different depth. You have current uh, effects happening, which causes mixture. But then you have also surface winds, which causes rippling or sun glint, which uh, can be hard to see in the, in the water. And anybody who's seen on the what sit on the waterfront and looks at sunset knows that it's hard to look into the water because the waves create this sun glint effect. And then something called clouds, because if there's clouds between these cameras and the Earth's surface, then you won't capture something. And knowing that most of the reefs in the, um, uh, are in the tropical environments where there's lots of clouds, that's an enormous challenge to get cloud-free imagery. And the imagery that we can look at, we usually look at the sensor types, the different pixel sizes, so the level of detail you can see, the extent, so how much one image captures, how often it revisits, uh, and how good the image is, uh, the signal to noise ratio. And one of the imagery we work with globally is the planet DOF imagery, and it's five meter pixel size. And there's 170 satellites going around the Earth's surface that are all from planet DOF, the size of a microwave. And together they create a mosaic almost, almost on a daily basis of the Earth's surface. Now, another imagery, the planet imagery usually costs money, although for the project we're working on, we got them donated basically. The Sentinel-2 imagery is another Sentinel satellite and it's 10 meter pixel and it, it still have a pretty high resolution, but not as much detail as the planet DOF but it's for free and it comes over every five days and uh, you could say have a complete coverage of the Earth's surface. There's two of those satellites. Then Landsat, the Landsat satellite is very special because it has been going since 88. So you can use it very well to look at time series of change. However, the pixel size is actually 30 meters, not 300 meters, so it's 30 meters. But that means that you can recognize maybe boats and buildings, but you can't recognize cars or, or tiny little boats or tinnies or people or something. And then we have MODIS satellites. And they cover the whole Great Barrier Reef in one go, but they have pixel sizes of 250 meters. And if you compare those three those four images on the top, you can see the level of detail that provides by these different imagery. And we use those different imagery for different parts of projects. And so also there's drone imagery. And drone imagery is like, seems to be your, your miracle wonder. However, to cover a whole um, area with high resolution images from drones is actually very hard to get because even if the engines get st stronger for drones uh, on the Great Barrier Reef, for instance, it's usually a 15 to 20 knot winds, it's pretty normal. Uh, and the drones will have a hard time, but there will still be sun ripples that makes it hard to look through the ocean. So with that knowledge of these beautiful pictures, you actually can't say how much reef there is or how much coral there is or how much algae there is, because it's a, we have a good understanding. We can all interpret, interpret it on our own way, but we can't use it qualitative, uh, quantitatively in further calculations. So, um, that's one of the questions we got to us. So how can we can make a global habitat map? Now that's based on our work in the in Heron where we've been annually going uh, to look at developing approaches, but also looking at uh, changes over time. And that resulted in some funding we got for the Capricorn Bunker Group to see if we can actually, with the data we had at the moment, create a map for the Capricorn Bunker Group without going to every single reef. And then we, that was so successful that we were asked to do the camps to Cooktown um, and all funded by the Great Barrier Reef Foundation. That resulted that we now are mapping the, all the, the reefs on the Great Barrier Reef um, as the first time ever uh, being done. However, that also resulted in the Allen Coral Atlas where we were asked to map all the reefs in the world. And this 231,000 roughly uh, of them, so that's a, a pretty big job. And with all these sets, like ideally, of course, as a keen diver and lover of coral reefs, I would like to go to every single reef, but obviously that's not doable. 
So when we look at mapping these reefs and grading large re regional reefs, then we have some considerations. We want to make maps that are repeatable and consistent in approach so that it's semi-automated, semi-automated, ideally automated, but at least semi-automated with methods that are publicly accessible so that people can, there's no hiding of our methods and people can see what we do. And we need a globally covering satellite image data set or a good detailed data set covering the area. Uh, and we created such an approach, um, but we had some constraints because how much we like to map deeper than 10 meters for foreign algae, we are overselling ourselves. If we would do that at a global scale. Uh, geomorphic, we can go a bit deeper, but uh, benthic, that to differentiate is hard. And how much we like to differentiate between coral and algae, it is one of the hardest things from remote sensing perspective to do. There are sensors, and there are specifically airborne sensors that can do it, but to do that um, on a global scale using satellites, that's not possible yet. Uh, then spatially, the maps are consistent at a large spatial scale. But if you zoom in in small areas that you know, then obviously you will find some errors in it because we need to adapt to this large scale mapping. And then temporal, at this stage, the maps are static. They are made for a, over two years period. And I'm pretty comfortable that in, if you wait one or two years more, then you could redo it. But it's not that if you have a mosaic, even if the imagery is daily, that you can do a daily map of the reefs. Um, and one of the other things that, which is really cool of the Allen Coral Atlas, but also the work on the GBR, that all the data that comes out of it is uh, GIS ready and the maps and imagery are available for anybody in the world. Anybody can download it. So one of the things we do to understand what's on the ground, we do these georeference photo transects. Um, and of course, we can't do it everywhere. So we set up a protocol that's pretty standard. Um, and that anybody who has a camera and a GPS access, uh, can start doing that. So it's very limited impact. It causes to have ge uh, photos georeferenced to the Earth's surface. And we can link it to the satellite image where they are. And this imagery can be analyzed with machine learning uh, through CoralNet or through ReefCloud with AIMS but it provides us with an enormous data set uh, of the environment. And the power of photos, of course, is that we can go back in time. And you don't need the specialist, the marine biologist, to basically analyze underwater what's there. So for the Great Barrier Reef, we did about, uh, we got funded by the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority to do the three day three habitat mapping project. Um, for that project, we went into the field and went to about 100 different reefs uh, out of the 3,000. And we did all these different field trips where we collected photo transects all over the place. And it's probably the most detailed data set that's covering not only the slopes, but also the reef flat. Because from a remote pen sensing perspective, we're not only mapping the pretty parts of the reef, so the reef slopes where all the coral is, but all, all the areas of the reefs because each of these areas are part of this complete ecosystem. So with that satellite and field data and a good descriptive classification scheme, we can start mapping. And usually that was what's used in the, uh, let's say in the, in the start five, ten, eight years ago. But now we're doing more, we're using our knowledge. So our understanding of reef crest is the most impacted part of the reef and it's neighboring a reef slope. So is reef crest has a high wave energy and if not neighboring slope, then it's probably misclassified. So we use our understanding of the reef. We can get depth from satellite imagery. Uh, we can get waves from, set, from the depth and we can get slope from the depth. And we can, and that together with training data that we create from, uh, or our own field data or uh, globally distributed field data, we uh, use that. So the satellite imagery provides us with really high resolution water depth. Um, uh, for the DBR work, I would say it, it's good to up to 20 meters. For the globally, it's very good to up to 10, 15 meters. But keep in mind, it's a different purposes, those two projects. Uh, with the water depth, we can do wind. And with the help of Dave Callahan, also here at UQ, 
we created these uh, wave uh, models, or wave climate for the whole Great Barrier Reef. So we got these geolocated photos. We got Sentinel-2 satellite imagery for the Great Barrier Reef. We got absolute water depth, so it's fixed to a datum. Uh, local wave climate, absolute slope, and the training data. That goes into an environment called Google Earth Engine where we ingest the data and we do a segmentation. So we're not only looking at the pixels, but we're looking at groups of pixels. It's what you're doing when you look at a satellite image or Google Earth. You're also interpreting textures, colors, but also neighborhoods. You know that if something is green and it's next to a river, it's quite likely mangrove if it's close to a tropical or coastal ocean. Uh, then we do uh, apply a random forest classifier based on the pixels and the segments using the different information layers uh, to inform the classifier. Once that is done, we do an object based cleanup where we basically say, okay, if reef crest, to be, uh, as the example, is not neighboring um, uh, slope, then we need to assess what's, what's wrong. And then we do an accuracy assessment. Now, with these data sets we, for the Great Barrier Reef, we do actually something extra. And with the help of Juan Carlos Ortiz, who worked at UQ as well, is now with Ames, uh, he developed a model for a relationship between wave height and coral cover for different coral types. And as a result of all the data sets that we have, we can predict coral type for the whole Great Barrier Reef for the reef slopes. So all the data is coming uh, online or is online already this month or, or beginning next month as part of the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority work and will be publicly accessible uh, for anybody to use. So these just are more localized, even though the GBR is really big, it's more localized specific for the Great Barrier Reef. Um, with the data, you can do some great things now, because if you look the gray bar on the left, the reef, we have unknown depth to where it goes but it represents the surface area of the reefs uh, of the Great Barrier Reef. But as you can see, we don't know how much geomorphic zones there are or how many, what kind of plenty composition this is. And with the data we collected from our work, we now can pull all those reefs together or look at an individual reef and get that information for those different reefs. Now, on top of that, because we, have this three-dimensional aspect of the reef with the really high, high quality depth, absolute depth data and our maps, we actually can look also at, at uh, the effect of the depth and the increase in surface area that is actually available. So if you look at this green line versus the red line, then because of incorporating that, the surface area of the reef is, is almost twice as big for corals or seagrass or algae to settle on than if you just purely look at the map extent. Um, and if you look at it from every geomorphic zone, then obviously you can see that the, the, uh, the shelter slope and the reef slope is almost four to four times as big in surface area. And it's a significant contribution to the reef system. And here I show the numbers for the whole Great Barrier Reef. But again, you can look at every individual reef. And here, this is the same for the benthic uh, aspect. Now, if you then look at the different zones, the management regions on the reef, you can look at coral habitat. How much area is there for corals to uh, I say, settle on uh, if you think of hard substrate only? Uh, you could group the geomorphic zones that represent hard substrate. Um, uh, or you do that with uh, the algorithm, the, the benthic classes. And then you can see for the different management zones on the Great Barrier Reef, there's different composition and different levels of uh, coral habitat available. So you can, this is for the first time we, we can actually start incorporating that into our management of the reef or into any science of the reef. Next to that, you could look at every different zone on the reef, the habitat protection zone, conservation park zone, the marine park, national park, the preservation zones. You could look at what the contribution is of coral habitat for each of these zones and how that's divided. Uh, 
um, John Day, who was involved with the first um, uh, marine park planning of the Great Barrier Reef, he contacted me if, after he saw this talk and he said, like, this is really great. We should now look do the re rezonation of the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park because we didn't have that data then. So he and I are talking about doing little studies on that. But also if you look at God's control, that has an impact. So if you look at uh, the existing maps of the reef, then you could say like, well, there maybe we should go for reef because there could be cots. But if you look at a satellite image, you realize, well, that's not completely right. But if you look at our maps, you can actually get a better understanding of what's there. And that's all nice, that's for the Great Barrier Reef, but we do a step up and we look at the reefs globally. And if you look at the reefs globally, then you can see there's uh, a layer that represents all the reefs in the world. Uh, it's called the UNEP WCMC layer. And it's a composition of different mapping methods used to create this uh, um, map, uh, I say, uh, yeah, map of all the reefs in the world. You can see that for every area, there's le different levels of detail, but you can also see the different methods used and you can see that some reefs are not mapped at all. Um, so if you look at the right top and the left bottom uh, image, they are based off the coral reef, uh, the Millennium uh, Coral Reef Habitat Mapping Project. Some great work by Cesc André Voix and team where they basically manually delineated geomorphic zonation based on Landsat imagery. And then you see the maps here from the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority on the right hand side, uh, bottom side, and it's the biggest reef in the world, according to the UNEP layer. But anybody looking at that realizes that that's probably something else. And it's actually a bank, but it's incorporated in that set. You see, uh, most of you will recognize Heron, and you see the outline of Heron is not the same as what's expected. Or you see next to that reef on the, on the, mid, on the bottom, you see these artificial features that basically are polar buffers around lines that say there's reef, but you can't see anything on the image. That doesn't mean there is no reef, but you can't see it. Or in the, um, the Red Sea, the reefs are mapped by the very coarse resolution satellite, uh, and it's very boxy. And so this is the highest level of, deep of maps available at the global scale. So that got Paul Allen, who is the uh, co-founder of Microsoft, uh, inter uh, interested. Uh, he uh, got a group of team together by through his uh, philanthropic organization Falcon, and uh, got together with Planet, who is provides the satellite imagery. Arizona State University, who helps with cleaning up the data. The University of Queensland, who doing the mapping and getting the verification data, and the National Geographic, who helps with engagement. That resulted that we get a low tide uh, mosaic of all the reefs in the world, uh, relative water depth, a global wave model, a relative slope, and we apply that to air uh, on mapping regions one by one. Uh, and you can see the little map on the bottom with the different mapping regions. And we're going through that process uh, as we speak. So, in that same process, part of my team is actually. Uh, browsing the internet, getting contact with all kinds of researchers throughout the world, uh, government agencies to, to collect data. And we go out ourselves also to collect data. We try to find any data that can help us better understand what we can see on the ground. We also go out ourselves. And obviously with COVID that stopped and we had to ask other teams in local countries to go out. So here you see a summary of some of the countries that went out and collected according to our protocols uh, data that we are using. Next to that, they provide us with data. So for instance, three weeks ago, I gave a talk for the United uh, Emirates and to get also you know, 120 people from the Middle East online from who we try to get data throughout the Middle East for helping to map those regions. And today we have mapped 16 out of 28 regions. Uh, there's still a couple of to go, but they are mostly the more smaller uh, reef areas of the world. Um, next to the mapping aspect of the, the atlas is also a monitoring aspect. 
and that's represented by a brightening mapping, where we use the NOAA data to find out windows where uh, we know there could not be coral bleaching happening due to the low temperatures. We collect all the satellite imagery and make image tags for those imagery, or I have to say the Euro Arizona State University focus on that, and we create a baseline image. That baseline image is then compared in moments when the ice bleaching is predicted and see if their reflectance value gets higher than what it was. The pixel brightness gets higher. And that gives us an idea of the brightening. Now then we use the, the habitat maps to focus on the coral algae area only so that we really get the more detailed idea where brightening of the reefs could be placed. This is tested for Hawaii, and we are now currently testing it for other regions in the world. Um, all these data sets are combined in the Allen Coral Atlas that anybody can access. And when you sign in and it doesn't cost anything, then you can actually upload your own area of interest and download the data for that area or request a download for it. Uh, yourself or students, I presented this at a um, geography teacher conference and um, marine science uh, teacher conferences. They can use this to do little analysis. They can have kids, uh, but also anybody, any age group, select areas of the reef and look at the composition, download it, put it in Excel and do comparison. Uh, and it, again, it's freely accessible, but you based on a globally uh, applied uh, system. So it's benthic maps, neomorphic maps, the brightening that you can see, but it's also the satellite imagery that you can download uh, and uh, the coral data from Coral Reef Watch that helps predicting uh, climate change. Now, if you go on that site and you must and you see things that you see make sense or don't make sense, please share that with us because we can use it to improve the Atlas uh, and the Atlas products in future. Um, we have now several examples. The National Geographic team works together with the public and in engaging with the public to basically use the maps for all kinds of purposes. Uh, that include uh, uh, develop, just looking at the imagery and deciding on where to set field uh, data sites, but also as an engaging tool with the community to understand the environment uh, or the st with, with stakeholders for developing marine protected areas, but also uh, prioritizing models for uh, aquaculture or sustainable aquaculture, uh, restoration, selecting restoration sites or disaster impact management. So for instance, when the big uh, ship came into um, Mauritius uh, on, on the reef, our maps were used to help with an assessment of the impact uh, on that area based on that ship. Now, it's not only reaching out and engaging and getting people to use, but we also work together with the Nature Conservancy uh, and they created uh, several toolkits. So this is uh, an online course, anybody can access it on Coral Reef Remote Sensing, uh, where several of the products we created um, are available. Uh, there's also a website you should go to, the, the Remote Sensing Toolkit, which uh, created by um, Stuart and myself. And these are all tools that help people understand how this come together. It's also a module that explains how the Allen Coral Atlas works and how you can uh, download and how you can use the data. During uh, conferences and symposia, we try to have workshops where people are trained in using the data or exposed to how to use the data. And there will be videos and online material on, to explain more. Um, so, summarizing, we, uh, the, as part of the Great Barrier Reef map, Habitat Mapping Project, there will be in this month, uh, next, beginning next month, coming a morphic, benthic and coral type map that is focused on the GBR and its locally, uh, uh, local use data sets. And then there's the Island Coral Atlas, which is uh, supposed to, uh, supposed to uh, we will finish all the mapping regions by July September 2021, and they will all be online and accessible for anybody to download. Um, and yeah, um, 
like I said, uh, it can directly be used. So we, in our, our in this talk and in this work, we show that we enhancing our capability to look at the Earth's environment using remote sensing, but also our knowledge of reefs and our understanding what's in the water. Um, we will always push to have our team go in the water to, to get a feel how it really looks like, because we need to translate it to reef systems globally. Um, future work is on how to innovate the different mapping methods and monitoring methods, but also, also to see how it could be integrated in management and how we can use engagement to get it used uh, on a global scale. It's not work by myself, it's a whole team and several of you will recognize some of these people. Um, uh, and I'm talking now only about the team that does the habitat mapping at UQ. Of course, there's a team in National Geographic, the Arizona State University as well, but um, yeah, lots of people. So yeah, if you have any questions, ask them now and uh, otherwise email me or, um, and I can respond there. Uh, thanks for listening. Um.